The Dirichlet function is defined as 1 when x is a rational number and 0 when x is an irrational number. And I find that the Dirichlet function is a perfect factory for memes. For example, if you have a work schedule that you only work when time is an irrational number, you are almost always working and you have infinitely many breaks. To laugh at this joke, we need to know some basic knowledge about the cardinality of infinities. And this video will be the gentlest introduction to those topics. First, let's build an intuition that a randomly picked real number between 0 and 1 is almost always an irrational number. Here is a random number and we don't know its identity, and we have to guess whether it's a rational number or a rational number. Let's do it digit by digit. Suppose we know the first digit after the decimal point is 3, what information does it provide for determining the rationality of the number? If this number is a rational number and the 3 is a repetent, then every single digit after the 3, the first 3, must all be 3. Imagine how likely is it? It is very very unlikely. One may argue that even this number is a rational number, the revelation of its identity can be delayed. What if 3 is not the repetent? This argument is true. Let's say the second digit after the decimal point is 9. And if 9 is the repetent, then every digit after the first 9 must be 9. If 3 9 is a repetent, we will have endless 3 9 pairs after the first pair of 3 9. What is the moral of the story? Well, being rational has a cost. You lose the freedom of choice. If you are a rational number, you can delay the revelation of your identity for as many digits as you want. But after a certain point, you are no longer random, you are completely fixed. An interesting argument is the change of base. If we rewrite one third in base 3, it just becomes 0 0.1. This is an illusion, because the repetent is just 0. Changing bases doesn't change the rationality of a number. There are infinitely many zeros after every terminating decimal. We can write down the probability for a randomly picked number to be a rational number. Changing bases doesn't change the nature of the exponential decay. And because real numbers are either rational or irrational, the probability of picking a rational number over the probability of picking an irrational number also follows this exponential decay. Lastly, because the number picking is completely random, the probability corresponds to the size of the sample space directly. And this is why we say that the size of the rational number is negligible compared to the size of the irrational number. What are we talking about when we talk about the size of the rational number? There are so many of them. Well, let's start talking about the size of some regular stuff. An empty set has no member, therefore its size is 0. A set that contains number 0 has the size of 1. Keep adding the integers to the side one by one, the size of the side increases one by one. There is no restriction that a set can only contain finite number of members. By including all the natural numbers, we get the most natural infinity, the size of the natural number. When dealing with sets of finite sizes, we say that two sets have the same size if we can create a one-to-one -one mapping between the members, a so-called bijection. This argument is simple and intuitive, but it fails miserably, or should I say beautifully, when we allow infinity to be the size of a set. For example, there are equal amounts of natural numbers and non-negative even numbers. For any natural number I pick, you can double it and get a non-negative even number. For any non-negative even number you pick, I can halve it and obtain a natural number. In this bijection, no number is left and no number is repeated. This is a shocking claim. The collection of non-negative even numbers is a proper subset 
of all the natural numbers, the size of a whole is the same as the size of a part of it. Let's say we are racing to infinity and I'm k integers in front of you. The distance between where we are and infinity are exactly the same. No matter how large the finite number k is, like even the fourth partition of 2, compared with infinity, we are equally far away from it. And finally, we all know that prime numbers are sparse, and they become more and more sparse. However, as long as we can arrange them and count them, we know there are equal amounts of natural numbers and prime numbers. The size of natural number, the most natural infinity, it is so important, so let's give it a name. How about Aleph zero? And we no longer use the term size, let's use the term cardinality. And our bijection argument will remain valid for sets of cardinality Aleph zero. So, what is the cardinality of a rational number? It is alpha zero. And now we are answering the question directly. The fact that rational numbers are both dense and infinite is not trivial. Think about the interval from zero to 10 inclusive. We only have 11 natural numbers, but there are already infinitely many rational numbers from zero to 10. So how is the mapping possible? The key of the proof is to construct a well-behaved order of rational numbers. I can arrange the rational numbers into groups. In each group, the denominator and the numerator add up to a constant. And inside each group, the members are arranged in ascending numerator order. And because every rational number can be written as a fraction, so we are not missing anyone. Now we can create a mapping from the natural numbers to the duplicated version of rational numbers. And of course, we can remove the duplication. And therefore, we have a bijection from the natural numbers to the rational numbers. I really, really like this result, because the countable infinity of natural numbers is understandable, because you go to infinity. But for rational numbers, it means I can squeeze countably infinite many numbers into a finite interval. That is crazy. Another way to look at rational numbers of fractions is to treat them as a Cartesian product of natural numbers. This suggests that the Cartesian product of alpha zero is also alpha zero. And by mathematical induction, the Cartesian product of k alpha zero is also alpha zero where k is any finite positive integer. From the bijection example we did earlier, it is also easy to conclude that the finite amount of summation of alpha zero is also alpha zero. Still remember this result? How did we send n to infinity? We sent n to infinity by checking every digits after the decimal point. This strongly suggests that although there are infinitely many rational numbers, its size is infinitely negligible compared to the size of irrational numbers. So, is the cardinality of irrational number 2 to the power of alpha of 0? The answer is true, but it's actually easier to prove that the cardinality of a real number is 2 to the power of alpha of 0. So let's prove that first. Let's assume that the cardinality of real number is alpha zero. Then the cardinality of real numbers between zero and one is also alpha zero. We can create a mapping fx that maps the interval zero to one to the whole real line that preserves rationality. Now, if the real numbers between zero and one are countable, and I can write them as binary numbers and arrange them in some order, the key is that all the real numbers from 0 to 1 are here. I'm not missing anyone. Now, I'm picking the first number's first digit after decimal point, the second number's second digit after decimal point, and I flip them to construct a new number. This new number is one digit different from any existing number. Therefore, it is not a real number as we already listed out all real numbers. This is clearly a contradiction. Recall that we construct this number 
by adding digit after the decimal point one by one up to Aleph zero. But each digit has two possibilities. Therefore, the cardinality of all real numbers between zero and one must be two to the power of Aleph zero. And two to the power of Aleph zero is also the cardinality of the whole real line. So, does two to the power of Aleph zero have a name? Well, it's a little bit complicated. We do have Aleph one, and it's defined as the smallest infinite cardinal number greater than Aleph zero. If you say two to the power of Aleph zero is Aleph one, you are accepting the so-called the continuum hypothesis. Mathematicians have proved that it is impossible to prove or disprove this hypothesis. For now, let's assume that it is true. Therefore, the cardinality of a real number can be denoted as Aleph one. By contradiction, the cardinality of a rational number must also be Aleph one, because if it is not, then the union of two Aleph zero infinity must also be an Aleph zero infinity, which is a contradiction. If you are tired of proof by contradiction in this video, here is the explicit bijection from real numbers to the irrational numbers. This is a weird function, but it works. Let's try a few numbers. So f one is one plus pi. How about one plus pi? It is one plus two pi. The idea is that each rational number will be shifted to the right by pi. And the original occupant will be shifted to the right by pi as well, so on and so forth. The function tells us that there is just enough room to do crazy stuff with infinity. Now you should be able to fully appreciate this joke, but that's not the end of the story. Imagine you are getting paid. How long do you actually work every day? And how can you define a proper integral of the Dirichlet function? And that's for another video in the future, my friend.